For the most famous person in human history except Jesus Christ, not much is actually known about Hitler's life. Random throwaway facts are known, such as his vegetarianism, and then myths have popped up and stuck, like the theory that he had one ball for some reason. Regardless, not many people actually take a deep dive into what made the man. Today, we'll dive into his childhood. I won't bore you with a long intro. This is literally just Hitler's childhood from the day he was born until his mother died. Let's see how it moulded him into the man he became. If this is well received, I'll continue onwards into his life until the day he dies, and eventually make a full biography, which will probably be a few hours long. So please hit like and leave a comment to show me if you're interested in seeing that. Before I begin though, I do need to thank my patrons who make these videos possible. Without them, this would be impossible in my current situation. Even the two dollar tier helps tremendously if you do happen to have a few spare dollars lying around and you enjoy these videos. We had our first Patreon Hearts of Iron 4 game on the Discord last weekend, and although a total mess, it was extremely fun. My telegram is also down below, but the chat is a total spam fest, so be warned. Hitler didn't talk about his family much, if at all. From what he did talk about, we can piece little together except that he didn't get along with his father, who was a kind of dictator figure in the household, like many men of those times were. His mother was the opposite, who he would adore. She was a quiet and kind woman who would be the key figure in his childhood. Claims are made to the origins of the Hitler family, but there's not much solid evidence to work with. Here is one of the more credible claims, but remember, this is just guesswork by historians. The main claim a lot of people here on YouTube make about Hitler potentially being part Jewish, the result of an affair between his ancestor, a maid, and her rich Jewish master, is clear nonsense, meant as a kind of gotcha, so people can be like, look, Hitler was actually Jewish, how ironic, but that's all it is. Fiction. More credible claims are that the family could potentially be Czech. Hitler was a weird name for an Austrian, and Hitler's biographer, John Tolland for one, suggests that they could be potentially derived from the names Hidlar or Hidlersek. Before our age, spelling wasn't as important as it is now. Names changed. It was the sound that mattered. Variants of the mentioned Czech names changed throughout the area of Hitler's family, from the ones just stated to Hedler, Hitler, and Hidler. A known ancestor of Hitler's in 1650 spelled his name Hedler, and some would use Hutler, and then the famous Hitler. What we do know is that both of Hitler's parents are from the Waldviertel, a rural area of Austria, northwest of Vienna. Hitler's father, Aloy, ran away from home at the age of 13 and made his way to Vienna, studied hard, and became a customs inspector at Braunau, just across the river from Germany. Hitler's father certainly got around and quickly had an illegitimate daughter, and his marriage put no restraint on his adventures. His wife was sick and 14 years older than him. Eventually, after a messy series of events involving Adolf's mother being installed as a maid in the household when she was 16, and Alois Hitler's previous wife dying, she became Clara Hitler. The whole story is with a video of its own on Hitler's family, another day. Clara was totally devoted to her husband and his children from the previous marriages, treating them as his own. Four months after her marriage, she gave birth to a son, and then a girl, and another boy within two years. All three died extremely young. <laughs> On April the 20th, 1889, however, she gave birth to a boy that would change the world forever, the most famous man of the 20th century. In the registry, he was entered as Adolphus Hitler. According to Clara, Adolf was a sick baby, and she understandably always lived in fear of losing him too. As a result, she lavished love and attention on him, effectively spoiling him. Most of the time, it was the two of them together. Alois Hitler spent more time at work, or his hobby, beekeeping, than at home. Supposedly, he also stopped his sexual adventures around this time. When Adolf was free, the family moved to Passau on the German side of the river when Alois was promoted. These years in Germany would have a long-lasting effect on Hitler, as later events showed. It was not until Hitler was aged five that Clara had her next child, Edmund. Hitler became a free man essentially after this. His father was sent to Linz, and his mother was busy with the new baby. Life was much different then, and he was free to roam endlessly, even at that young age. He spent hours wandering around the area, playing with the other children. For a year, this was Hitler's life. When that year was up though, the family moved once again, this time to a small farming community, 30 miles from Linz. Hitler remained fairly separated from his mother though, as he was enrolled at a primary school a few miles away. It took more than an hour to walk there every day. His father also retired around the same time. Both his father and the school were incredibly strict quite the contrast to the previous year of freely wandering around. The head teacher of the school remembers Adolf as mentally very much alert, obedient, but lively, and that he kept the contents of his school bags in exemplary order. Adolf himself recalled in Mein Kampf that, it was at this time that the first ideals took shape in my breast. All the playing about in the open, the long walk to school, and particularly my association with extremely husky boys, which caused my mother bitter anguish, made me the very opposite of a stay at home. Adolf's father didn't enjoy his life in retirement and was not a skilled farmer. In 1896, another Hitler was born, Paula. He began drinking more and took out his anger on his namesake, Alois Jr., from the previous marriage. 
He would ruthlessly beat the boy, one time holding him against a tree by the back of his neck until he lost consciousness. He was also quoted as beating the family dog until it would cringe and wet the floor, maybe explaining Hitler's later love for animals, and especially dogs. One of the first laws the future Chancellor would pass, weeks after coming into office, would be one on animal testing and cruelty. Apparently, Adolf was whipped also, but not as often. Clara, his wife, also got it. Life sounded awful for those living under Alois' oppressive regime at home. Alois Jr. followed in the footsteps of his father. He ran away at the age of 14. Soon after, the family moved again. They moved to Lambach, not far from their current farm, which Alois had just sold. Adolf enjoyed the new school he was enrolled in, and supposedly had excellent grades. He enrolled in the school choir at the monastery, and classmates recalled that he had a great singing voice. For the first time, he saw the swastika on the stone arch of the monastery, their coat of arms. He recalls being intoxicated with that solemn splendour of brilliant church festivals. He idolised the clergy, and had designs to join the church himself. One quote describing Adolf at the time goes, As a small boy, it was his most ardent wish to become a priest. He often borrowed the large kitchen apron of the maid, draped it around his shoulders, climbed on a kitchen chair, and delivered long and fervent sermons. His mother was a devout Catholic, and clearly would have supported these designs, had he gone through with it. The family now lived on the second floor of a large house connected to a mill. This was the best location possible for his favourite childhood game, Cowboys and Indians. The family who owned the mill said Adolf was a little rogue, rarely at home, but always where something was happening, usually as the leader in raids on pear trees or other pranks. Whenever he came home, his clothes were always torn, and his skin covered in scratches and bruises. Alois, though, again, didn't like this place. He moved the family once more. They never seemed to settle anywhere long. They moved yet again to a village on the outskirts of Linz. With Alois Jr. gone, Adolf now bore the brunt of his father's rage. Paula Hitler recalled that it was Hitler who challenged my father to extreme harshness and who got his sound thrashing every day. He was a scrubby little rogue, and all attempts of his father to trash him for his rudeness and to cause him to love the profession of an official of the state were in vain. How often, on the other hand, did my mother caress him and try to obtain with her kindness where the father could not succeed with harshness? Eventually, Adolf decided to follow in his brother's footsteps and run away from home. Somehow, though, his father found out, and Adolf was locked in his room. That night, Adolf tried to squeeze through the barred window and escape. He couldn't quite fit, though, so he took off his clothes and tried again. His father heard and charged upstairs, and Adolf was only able to grab a tablecloth to cover himself. Alloy came in and burst out laughing and shouted to Clara to come and look at the toga boy. Apparently, it took Adolf a long time to get over this embarrassing episode. Adolf found a new way of coping with the brutal regime that his father ran in the Hitler household. He read in an adventure novel that it was courageous to show no pain. Adolf said, I then resolved never again to cry when my father whipped me. A few days later, I had the opportunity of putting my will to the test. My mother, frightened, took refuge in front of the door. As for me, I counted silently the blows of the stick which lashed against my rear end. According to Hitler, from that day on, his father never touched him again. Around the age of 11, Adolf found his famous talent, drawing. We even have drawings available to us that he made from this time. He would spend his study time sketching endlessly. A classmate once recalled that he watched in awe as Hitler recreated an entire castle from memory. Around the turn of the century in Germany and Austria, Western novels were hugely popular with young people. Adolf's tales of noble Indians and rough and tough cowboys on the frontier fascinated his classmates. Despite him never having been there, he seemed like a man of the world. In playtime, he would always have to be the cowboy. Adolf was totally obsessed with these novels. He would stage violent reenactments and would recruit older boys and even girls to join in. Another obsession of Hitler's was the Franco-Prussian War. To us, that seems like an ancient war compared to World War II, but that war was far closer to Hitler than the Second World War is to us on the timeline. This was part of the German national story, a gigantic flawless victory over the ancient enemy, France, and interest was still high in the war 30 years later. Hitler said, It was not long before the great historic struggle had become my greatest inner experience. From then on, I became more and more enthusiastic about everything that was in any way connected with war, or, for that matter, with soldiering. When the Boer War broke out, Hitler was fascinated by the struggle of the Boers and would lead his friends in reenactments of this war also. When his father would send him out for tobacco, Adolf would be out far longer, busy playing as the Boers, only for his father to be furiously angry when he returned. That same year, Adolf's brother, Edmund, died at the age of six, causing immense agony for his mother, and Adolf was the one left to carry on the family name. His father would try pushing his career on Adolf, and he nodded along and agreed with him, but in reality, he only ever wanted to be an artist. He kept this plan to himself. <laughs> In 1900, Adolf set off to Linz, where the nearest real shul was located. 
a kind of school which focuses on preparing the student for university and specialises in classical education. He struggled almost immediately. This wasn't the small country schools he was used to, and he was no longer top of his class, the most talented, or the leader, like he had been before. There was very little one-on-one -on -one learning with the teacher at such a big institution. Hitler retreated into his shell, like many shy children do, and showed a considerable lack of interest in his work. Over time, though, he improved. One classmate described him in this quote, He had guts, but wasn't a hothead, but really more amenable than a good many. He exhibited two extremes of character, which are not often seen in unison. He was a quiet fanatic. Eventually, after school, he found a new gang to lead. After school, they would go and play cowboys and Indians by the river. He would subject this new group to speeches about the Boer War, and he would draw sketches of the brave Boers who he viewed as heroes. Apparently, he even talked of enlisting in their army, to the amusement of his friends. Hitler also massively admired Bismarck, who it was a crime to possess a picture of at those times in Austria. They were forbidden from singing German nationalist hymns, and the like also, but did anyway. The youth of Austria wished to be united with their ethnic brothers. Many suggest that Hitler being especially into Germany was due to his father being a huge supporter of the Habsburg regime, and this was a kind of rebellion. At the age of 12, he would watch his first Wagnerian opera at the Linz Opera House. He was totally captivated by it, and during his years as a young adult in Vienna, he would frequently attend the opera. That year, he was much more successful at school. Life took a downwards turn for the Hitlers soon though, as Adolf's father would on the 13th of January 1903 sit down at the dinner table and remark that he wasn't feeling very well, then a few minutes later, he died of a hemorrhage. The family was left with a decent pension, and things were okay at first. There was now no obstacle to Hitler chasing his dream of becoming an artist. His mother was not up to the task of following in Alois' footsteps and steering Hitler towards becoming a civil servant. His mother's influence declined further when he moved to Linz to room with an old lady and five other schoolboys to save him the three mile walk to school every day. He was always very polite and formal with everyone there, and he would spend nights staying up late studying and drawing on maps, a true paradox gamer of his day. His schooling that year was a total failure, and his exam results were miserable. He was told yet to repeat a year unless he passed a special exam in the autumn. His old joys of playing outside slowly came to an end, and he became more and more of a recluse, preferring drawing inside. He did end up passing the exam, though. He was now in the third form, which was much harder than he was used to. French was his hardest subject, and he would dismiss the subject as a total waste of time later on. The only teacher that did manage to make an impression on Adolf, though, was Leopold Poch, his history teacher. Adolf was fascinated by his lectures on the ancient Teutons. Hitler spoke of him in Mein Kampf, saying, I think back with gentle emotion on this grey-haired man, who by the fire of his narratives sometimes made us forget the present, who, as if enchanted, transformed us into past times and out of the millennial veils of mist, moulded dry historical memories into living reality. On such occasions we sat there, often aflame with enthusiasm, and sometimes even moved to tears. Hitler's devotion to the Catholic faith waned as he became a nihilistic teen, he was confirmed in May 1904, which was a total bore to him. His sponsor describes Hitler at the time, None was so sulky and surly as Adolf Hitler. I had almost to drag the words out of him. It was almost as though the whole business, the whole confirmation, was repugnant to him, as though he only went through with it with the greatest reluctance. Hitler failed French that year, and he passed his makeup exam, but only on the condition that he not return to the school for the last form. He had to move once again, this time to Steyr, 25 miles away. He was equally as unhappy there, and would often skip school, going to ridiculous lengths to not do any of the schoolwork. Once he turned up to class with a huge scarf, and pretended to have lost his voice, it worked, and he got sent home. He dragged himself through the year, and somehow managed to get decent grades. He was told that he could graduate if he completed a special exam in the autumn, like he had done to get past previous years. His mother, meanwhile, had sold the family farm, and moved to a rented flat in Linz. During the time away from his mother, Hitler was no longer a boy, but the typical youth with messy hair, a very faint moustache, and a bohemian look. Hitler returned home to spend some time with his mother, then suffered a long infection which brought him and his mother even closer together, given how many of her children had been taken by illness before, but came out okay, and then returned to take his exam. He passed, and got drunk for the first time with his friends to celebrate. He was awoken on the highway by a milkwoman. He felt incredibly humiliated, and vowed never to drink again, which he stuck to. This was the only time Adolf Hitler ever got drunk. Instead of doing the final exam for a diploma, despite just getting his certificate, Hitler tried and succeeded in getting out of it. He used his illness as an excuse and persuaded his mother to let him stop his studies. The concerned mother obliged. Many say that Hitler lied about his ill health, but his sister says that it was absolutely real and that he was plagued by coughs, especially on damp, foggy days. At 16 years old, Adolf Hitler became a drifter, as he would remain for almost a decade. He spent his time reading, drawing, and heading to museums and operas. He wandered around Linz on his own, 
dreaming of the future in his head. Late in 1905, he met his best friend, August Kubizek. The two would be the best of friends for years to come, and would reunite after the Anschluss, after decades, as if no time had passed at all. Kubizek had a dream also, to be a world-famous musician. The two complemented each other perfectly, the artist and the musician. Kubizek says Hitler at the time was incredibly reserved and meticulously dressed. He says, he was a remarkably pale, skinny youth about my own age. Hitler didn't like talking about himself and would also push the conversations the two had towards art and music. They would attend the operas together almost every time there was one on and the arts were truly the glue of the friendship. Eventually though, Hitler opened up and talked of his dreams of being an artist himself and gave passionate speeches about his dreams and ambitions. Over time, the relationship became almost hero worship from Kubizek towards Hitler. He described Hitler's random speeches as like a roaring volcano and he was fascinated by the man. The connection between Hitler's receptive audience here early on, and the skill he would later show with his speeches, and the way the audience would react, doesn't really need explaining. Kubizek says that he would stand gaping and passive, forgetting to applaud. They would sit on the beach together discussing the future while Adolf painted, read, and sketched. Somehow, Adolf always said the right things to Kubizek. He said later, He always knew what I needed, and what I wanted. Sometimes I had a feeling that he was living my life, as well as his own. During this period, Adolf's mother was also taken in by his visions of the future, allowing him to continue on this path, rather than pushing him to learn a trade or something more stable. In 1906, she allowed him to complete his childhood dream, a visit to Vienna, the home of art and music in Europe at the time. He spent an entire month there taking in the sights. He was totally enthralled by the place. When he returned, he was even more passionate than ever about his dream of becoming a famous artist. He talked to his best friend of his vision for the future for the two of them. They would rent out the entire second floor of a large house across the Danube and work in the two rooms, furthest apart, so that Kubizek's music wouldn't be a distraction. Adolf himself would furnish every room, create the murals, and design the furniture. Their apartment would become the headquarters for a circle of like-minded individuals. The duo bought a lottery ticket to attempt to realise this dream, and discussed how they'd spend the winnings. Obviously, they didn't win. Adolf's mood, like most teenagers, bounded between grand visions of the future and sinking depression. This was brought more towards the latter, though, when his mother became sick. On the 14th of January, Clara Hitler called on a Dr. Edward Bloch, who it is worth noting, given we're talking about Adolf Hitler, was Jewish. He was known locally as the poor people's doctor. She was suffering from incredible chest pain, and it turned out that she had breast cancer. The doctor didn't tell Clara all the bad news, but called Adolf and his sister, Paula, and told them that their mother was gravely ill. News that would massively change any teenage boy. Bloch told them that it was very unlikely she would live, and the only slight chance of her making it would be surgery. Tears flowed from Hitler's eyes as the doctor explained this to him. Clara risked the operation at a Catholic hospital in Linz on January 17th. One of her breasts was removed, and she spent weeks recovering. Some sources talk of Hitler falling in love around this time. The stories sound a little ridiculous and far-fetched, but I'll say them nonetheless, just take them with a grain of salt. One talks of an encounter in a barn, where a girl was milking a cow, and then when she showed no willingness to go further, Adolf ran off, knocking over a pot of milk. This one sounds especially silly, like it's from a cartoon, and made up to make Adolf seem goofy, much like the one ball myth. More credibly though, at one point, he became very attached to a girl named Stephanie. He spoke of her endlessly to Kubizek and wrote poems about her and claimed he was in love with her, yet wouldn't introduce himself to her. Kubizek blames it on Hitler being embarrassed due to his profession and that he hadn't made it as an artist yet. When Stephanie never made the first move, Hitler imagined that she was angry with him and said that he could bear it no longer and that he would jump off the bridge into the river. Eventually though, Stephanie faded into the background due to more important events and she would later recount that she had absolutely no idea that Hitler was in love with her. This story sounds much more realistic than the strange barn one, most reading this probably felt similar up and down emotions when they were in their mid-teens too. He would discuss endlessly with Kubizek his grand plans to redesign Linz, much like he would his Führer years later with Speer. For the most part though, his life was boring and isolated. He slept in late and stayed inside most days reading and painting. A crisis in the family arose, where Adolf was being pushed to get a job. A family friend even found a willing baker to take him as an apprentice, but ultimately his mother got the final say, and she agreed to let him continue on with his dreams. That summer, he was allowed to withdraw his patrimony, and it was enough for a year in Vienna, including school fees at the famous art academy. He reluctantly left home, feeling terrible for leaving his sick mother. He had to go now, though, or he would miss the entrance exam. Hitler bombarded his family and Kubizek with postcards before going silent. Kubizek headed out to find out where he was from his mother. When he arrived, she appeared to be deteriorating already, being away from her son, and she looked a sorry sight. She complained to Kubizek, lambasting herself for not making Hitler get a normal job nearby, or making him take more responsibility for helping raise Paula. As we all know by now, Adolf failed his exam. He lived a depressing existence, renting a small flat from an old Polish lady. He asked for an explanation for his failure, 
and was told his drawings showed my unfitness for painting and that my ability obviously lay in the field of architecture. Kubizek had told him this all along, and now he began to agree with him. Back home, the end was coming for his mother, and Adolf rushed back to see her. He consulted Dr. Bloch, and was told that drastic treatment was needed immediately to save her life. The doctor started telling Adolf that he would owe him a lot of money to save her life though, as the treatment was extremely expensive. Adolf was okay with this, just going along with it to make sure his mother made it. The doctor allowed him to pay afterwards for the surgery, as long as he paid for the drugs now. Adolf turned up at Kubizek's door, looking a broken man, before beginning his speech against doctors. Why could she not be cured? Surely they could do something. Clara went through the treatment in absolute agony. The treatment went a little like this. The gauze for the wounds was saturated with iodoform, a kind of disinfectant, and then folded around the wound. The iodoform burns its way into the tissue, and then once it's in your system, you can't swallow. Clara's throat burned as she couldn't quench her burning first, and every liquid she drank now tasted like poison. Adolf rarely left her side, and was totally devoted to her as she approached the end. Having her son there rose her spirits, despite the pain, and those there say it was visible on her face. Kubizek was amazed by the way the previously lazy Hitler took over as the man of the house and cared for his mother like a saint. He acted like a father to his younger sister, and told her off if she did badly at school. The end for his mother was just around the corner though, as much as he didn't want to accept it. She was living in torture. Hitler's face would clench up and he'd show a pained, grimaced look whenever he saw his mother going through her struggle. One time, Kubizek walked in on Hitler supporting his mother. She looked half dead. Adolf motioned Kubizek to leave, but before he could, Clara called out to him, Go on being a good friend to my son when I'm no longer here. He has no one else. In the early hours of the 21st of December, under the glow of a Christmas tree, Clara died quietly. Dr. Bloch tried to comfort Hitler, telling him that death had been a saviour, as she had been in such agony in life. This did nothing to comfort Hitler. Dr. Bloch said later, In all my career, I never saw anyone so prostrate with grief as Adolf Hitler. The death of Hitler's mother is probably the best place to bring the story of Adolf Hitler's childhood to an end. After this, he was instantly thrust from being a boy to a man. This truly was the turning point for him, and life would never be the same again. I'll make a full video in future on his time in Vienna, his time on the streets as a true grifter, and his life in general before the First World War. All in all, Hitler's childhood didn't show anything too out of the ordinary. Attempts are often made to display Hitler as an almost inhuman character. People assume that something must have happened early on to make him this way. The truth is that Adolf Hitler is a human being, just like you or me. If anything shaped Hitler, it was his time in Vienna, the First World War, and the Weimar period. There's a reason a man like Hitler only came out of the chaos of Germany, not the far less chaotic locations of Great Britain or France. It was the conditions that made the man. He didn't just appear one day to cause havoc and commit evil, like the narrative goes. His childhood, however, did form some of his later traits. His rebelliousness against authority like with his father, his love of animals with the beating of the family dog, his skills as an orator that he spent hours practicing with Kubizek, bombarding him with rants daily. Other than that, it was all pretty usual for the time. Thank you for watching, and then especially a big thanks to my patrons who make these videos possible. Every single donation helps in my quest to do this full time and bring you longer and more frequent videos. Thanks to Lobster to you, Darway Lolalol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Cameron, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Lanza, Friendly Brian, and Mr. Malabar.